you chairing tonight? Oh, there we go. We're on. Uh, we're being live to stream now, so I passed the first hurdle. Uh, Abdi, uh, my my brother's secretary, my comrade, can you read the harassment statement for us tonight? Thank you, comrade Chef. Good evening, comrades, and happy New Year to all. It's the policy of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council to declare our absolute opposition to any discrimination or harassment. To ignore discrimination or harassment is to condone the acts of the harasser and further penalize the victim. Union solidarity is based on the principle that we are all brothers, sisters, and comrades, that we are all equal. Discrimination and harassment erodes the, that principle because it assumes that some union members are inferior. Discrimination and harassment are expression of power or perceived power and superiority. It's intended that this policy send a clear message to the harassers that their actions will not be tolerated and to empower victims with the support of their union sisters, brothers, and comrades. Back to you, Comrade Jeff. Thank you, my friend. Uh, now we'll go over to our, our comrade uh, Jinky from the Library Workers for our land acknowledgement. Good evening, comrades. We are meeting this evening on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, which is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Anishkabi and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. Today, we acknowledge that we are covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credits. We also acknowledge the many broken promises and treaties that we need and the need to work towards reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land, both in the present and for future generations. Back to you, brother. Uh, back to you, comrade Irons. <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. It's just for simplicity's sake, call me Jeff. Just don't call me late for dinner. Now, uh, Susan, can you uh, maybe just go over the basic Zoom functions for us? Just for if we have anyone new to this uh, this platform. Sure. Thanks very much. So um, it looks like everybody here is already doing this, but we do ask people to keep themselves muted uh, unless you are going to be speaking to keep the background noise to a minimum. Um, every now and then we hear some embarrassing things from uh, from folks um, Zoom calls. The um, Use the chat function, please, if you feel like making points or identifying resources or asking any questions that we might be able to answer that way. If you do want to raise your hand to speak, um, if you're online, go down to the reactions button and look for the icon that actually says raise hand. And that'll put you up in our top left hand corner of the, the co-host screen so that we can see that you've got your hand up. If you're on the phone, you can do that by pushing star nine. And voting takes place electronically. Uh, and we, we do that through an online function. So those who are on the phone don't have the opportunity to vote online. A heads up that we are gonna be doing um, a bit of a survey later on. So if you are on the phone, um, maybe we can arrange to email you the survey questions. So we'll deal with that when we come to it. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. I tell you, the, the staff behind the scenes at the Labor Council, they'd make this seem uh, flawless. Uh, they do work so hard on the behalf of all of us. So as usual, is there any uh, first time delegates present tonight? Please raise your hand so you can be recognized for joining us for your first uh, delegates meeting. Uh, I see one, two. I see Romy Sugden. And Vincent Adai. Well, that's awesome. Welcome all. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's uh, important. One hand doesn't clap alone, and it's great when we can come together like this. Uh, we're going to be monitoring the chat for any questions or whatnot. Uh, 
video if to make sure nobody does anything wrong because this is a respectful meeting where we're here to work together to a common goal and we don't want to uh, cross any lines and that's why we ask you to mute so there's nothing more annoying in the background other than me sharing this that being said uh let's uh review the minutes they were emailed out ahead of time to the board members uh they'll be uh posted up uh for uh, your vote on whether you accept or reject. Uh, voting will take place here on uh, electronically. Is the minutes gonna be posted in the chat? Oh, Susan, sorry, you're muted. Oh, nope, Susan's, oh, the one finger means, slow down, Jeff, I'm getting to it. And I apologize, I had to put um, a, a slightly unformatted version in there, but um, we did send out the properly coped set of minutes. Thank you. Thank you. So th those of you who have been pre previous delegates, you would have got this by email with the links and everything else tonight. Uh, is, there, is there any uh, omissions or... or Questions? See a none real. There's there's the link to the minutes. Susan's uh or Jennifer just posted it. So hopefully you're all tech savvy. Uh can we go to the vote then? See none, no issues being raised. There's the vote. Nice and simple. You can yes, no, or abstain. Don't forget to hit the submit. We'll uh go. We'll give you a, a few seconds just so everyone has an opportunity to vote. I'm happy to announce it's 2 nothing Canada in the World Juniors gold medal round. Um, yeah, it's a multitask thing. And uh, it's 0-0 zero, zero in the leaf <laughs> score. The results of the poll, I guess, will, I, I believe it's Cindy usually counts it down. She can't if I keep talking. Yes. Hi, everyone. Five seconds left to vote. Five, four. Three, two, one, and poll. Back to you, uh, Vice President Iron. We have a pass with uh, 97%. Awesome. Thank you very much. So now we'll go over to uh, hey, Comrade uh, Blair from the Sheet Metal Workers for a credential report. I saw you, Blair. There you are. Thank you. Uh... Vice President Jeff, acting chair, comrade. Tonight for Thursday, January 5th, the credential report is QP Local 79, 13 delegates, and QP Local 1777, one delegate. So nice so move. Thank you very much, uh, my friend, my uh, building trade comrade. Uh, we'll have a, a, a vote on the credential report, a quick poll to accept uh, our newly seated uh, delegates. And there it is again, nice and simple, nice and easy. Click how you wish and don't forget to submit. And I'll uh, mute so Cindy can count us down at the appropriate time. Thank you, comrade. Comrades, five seconds left to vote. Five, four, three, two, one, and four. Mr. Vice President, Jeff, we have a uh, passive 95%. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, for, for simplicity's sake, just call me Jeff. Uh, so now we'll go on to the strike report. Uh, we're moving right along. Does anyone have a, a strike or lockout report to make? Please raise your hand to be recognized. I'm looking to see if there are any hands raised either through the raise hand function or with people's physical hands up. And I don't see anybody uh, asking to give a strength report. Well, that's that's a good thing, I guess. A little bit of a uh, labor piece is always nice after the holiday season. Uh, next, uh, I'd like to uh, move on to our, our guest speaker. Uh, he's familiar to many of us here. Uh, 
we've been worked on campaigns over the last while or or uh, done anything with the Urban Alliance, especially with Black History Month and stuff come up, I'd like to introduce uh, comrade Nathan Shan. Nathan is the executive director for the Urban Alliance on Race Relations. He's a former city councillor, current vice chair of the Toronto District School Board and trustee for Scarborough Rouge River, a good friend to the NDP and an all around decent fella. So thank you. He'll be talking to us today about the uh, recently legislated Bill 23 and Bill 39, which is what our uh, statement's gonna be on and its impact on all of us. The implication of these two bills uh, for working people into 2023 and beyond. Over to you, my comrade. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank you, comrade. Thank you, um, sisters and brothers. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first official Zoom meeting um, <laughs> of the year. So happy new year to everyone. It's good to start the year with virtually with all of you. Um, uh, hopefully this year, uh, you know, we continue to be building on our previous uh, achievements and struggles and, and, and achieve more fairer and more just uh, society uh, in our city and around in our province and the country. Uh, this January is also Tamil Heritage Month. As a, as a Tamil Canadian, I want to extend uh, uh, all, all of my uh, appreciation to the labor unions that have st stood with the Tamil community over the many past years, including uh, when we had uh, major challenges uh, holding uh, the Sri Lankan government accountable uh, for the genocide that was happening and many of the labor uh, union representatives here were with us on the streets and so um, it's a good way to start the year with that reminder that we we are all in this together um, fighting together for struggles both locally and globally. Um, I was asked um, to speak a bit about um, Bill 23 and 39 and and what what it does to our communities and, and you know we have to find a better accountability around how they name these bills. You know, one is called the Better Municipal Governance Act, and the other one is called More Homes Built Faster Act. And you know, uh, they should just leave it with numbers. And <laughs> it is it is hard to be talking about these in these titles because they are exactly the opposite. Um, and and so um, you you know, there has been a pattern of democracy under attack in our city, in our province, in our country. You know. And the turnout of people coming out to vote has gone down significantly, particularly uh, by legislated actions like these. It's not by accident that people are becoming disinterested in politics because they feel like, uh, you, you know, the promises, the, one of the biggest promise uh, that was made is to not to touch the green belt. And then within months, we have this happening. And and the the fact that you know turnouts are lower and 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 what we what we saw happen at city council with the municipal uh, councils becoming smaller uh, council number of size uh, number of the councillors becoming smaller and the ridings becoming larger we already had pockets of our communities that were dissent for that 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 voices were in, uh, not valued and now with this new um, legislation uh, we see that the city is moving toward a situation where it is going to be and nothing democratical about how decisions are going to be made. In fact, um, these are forms of legislative discrimination. In fact, it, it disproportionately impact uh, communities of uh, racialized communities, communities living in low income uh, parts of our, our city, uh, particularly because you know, our representation is lost. You know, we might have people who can say what we want at the, at the council meetings, but just councillors saying what they what they what we want to hear is not enough because the decision then ultimately ends up being made by a few, and and you know it is weird that um, Doug Ford wants to be both premier and mayor at the same time, and that continues to be the case because the way uh, the last four years and this this next four years are going to be is trying to do uh, control um, both municipal governments as well as the provincial government in a way that is uh, not transparent, that is not accountable, uh, and not just Toronto, but many other larger municipalities across Ontario has, have become victims of this wish to control. Uh, and, and those who are involved in municipal politics know that municipal politics have huge power in how it impacts our communities. And, 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 and Doug Ford clearly knows that huge power in how it impacts our communities positively, but also huge power in how it could benefit uh, larger uh, corporate sector developers and so on. So uh, all these are not happening by accident. It's 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 his way of continuing to 
privilege his friends and 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 have access to decision making in in non democratic way so i think one of the things that i i think would be very important for us is that uh, municipal governments don't have a coordinated opposition you know there are councillors who are progressive of course and and there are some that are questionable and still call them progressive uh, but but we don't have because we don't have an official opposition structure there are a lot of things get done uh, without accountability already at city council and now with this new legislation uh, there will be no way that we will be able to hold um, hold the government accountable and it's a slippery slope it doesn't affect one part of our segment of our of our population it affects all of us um, the the buzzword housing has been co-opted by folks to control further uh, markets and there's nothing affordable i was a city councilor for a couple of years and i knew that you know land was being sold to corporations and developers uh, to build affordable housing and when you dig deeper it will be like you know maybe 10% of the units are going to be affordable maybe in those 10% of the units the affordability is kind of criteria is so vague that it's it's maybe 70% 80% of the market rent which is already too high so all these terms are being used to promote selling of public land uh, and and make it palatable for people to accept it but when it really happens and what gets built we know that it's not really truly affordable so a rights based approach is necessary so uh, at all levels of government this concept of housing and affordable housing has been used to further uh, perpetrate inequity so we have to be very very uh, careful about this the second part of the thing i want to quickly mention i only have 5 minutes i can speak for an hour on this uh, is the is the second priority that the province has made you know first priority is obviously housing the second priority that the uh, the province says that it wants to push uh, is called anything that supports housing and they put utility service roads um transit and everything under the roof this basically gives power to the municipal government uh, particularly to the mayor and and potentially one third of the of the council power to decide on almost all of the infrastructure related decisions because everything could be seen as impacting housing um so this is a dangerous slope and i know some might feel like housing is a priority why don't we go ahead with it but this is not the right way to go about it this doesn't bring accountability this doesn't bring it affordability to housing in fact this is going to perpetrate the inequities that exist in our in our city the developers are getting away without uh, accountability around zoning accountability around development charges and so on that goes to support many of our uh, our our communities in fact you know if you look at where houses are being built in this in the suburban communities um lots of houses have been built that are over a million dollar but there's no social infrastructure that's being built there's no library being built there's no uh community services being invested on so this concept of of uh unaccountable processes is going to be a very difficult thing so what i wanted to leave is 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 on the note of um what what the recommendations are there's a recommendation that asks for um uh you know bringing increased accountability and holding um asking for an inquiry into how these decisions were made and how it has uh, you know potential implications to those who had bought the lands and 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 benefited them that inquiry has to happen but more importantly we last year saw an amazing fight and a win with all the unions coming together with educational workers against the notwithstanding clause we knew the notwithstanding clause being used against workers as a tool would have a domino effect if goes unchecked on all workers and every worker every workers union private uh, public um, recognize that this is a similar in fact this is also something of the equal scale that we need to understand and be together and in fact we cannot be organizing around one issue over the other because the way ford government has been acting is that they throw five six different things and hope that two of those things they are happy to reverse and the other three things just still pass so we have to be organized enough as as a as a coalition and we're hoping that all of us racialized justice uh, racial justice advocates like our organization a community activists um labor come together and form a solid ground of of being ready all the time because next 4 years is about being ready next 3 to 4 years is going to be about being ready all the time and being able to uh, transfer our movement uh in a flexible way to fight different fights at the same time because otherwise we would be kind of getting tired um being thrown into different directions deliberately uh to get us off guard so um picking up from that victory uh, i think we have huge momentum going into this year and i'm hoping that all of us can work together and build on on the successes and build on the solidarity that we built 
uh, and fight this fight together. And so I'll stop with that. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words here. Well, thank you very much, uh, comrade, for adding some texture and some background and your comments on this. Because what 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 comrade Shen says is so true about coming together and forming those coalitions. So hopefully, while uh, we're getting a little bit of background and a little bit of texture to the 23 and uh, 39, you had a chance to read the statement if you didn't get to your emails earlier today that were out. And uh, we'll open the floor for the recommendations of the executive board. Uh, is there any speakers, anyone who wishes to comment? Raise your hand. This for, for those of you that are new or, or watching on YouTube, it, it's generally there's a statement from the executive board about actions that we should take apart. And there's a list of recommendations from the uh, executive board for the uh, Labor Council, us, the delegates here, the friends of labor to get involved and take action with how to correct these things. Well. That's surprising. So there, if you look on your screen, now we have the recommendations of, of the action that the Labor Council, and that's all of us, uh, not, not just the staff or the uh, officers, take call on John Tory and the, the counselor. I'm not gonna read it. No. Comrade Jeff, can I just touch on that quickly? You are more than welcome. You are more than welcome. Always love to hear from you. So I, listen, I, I think um, with what we saw with uh, education workers, uh, with Go Transit, um, look, labor really stepped up and, and we've sent a message uh, to all levels of government. Uh, then also seeing how we changed uh, municipal powers by getting more progressives, uh, not just at city councilors, but at school board trustee levels. Uh, we just had comrade Nathan Shan talk, um, who's definitely a friend of ours. Uh, look, the, the pressure's on. Um, they know that we have power in numbers um, and they're saying that they don't care. So now look, this statement, I think it is very important. Now is our time to keep the pressure on. Look, uh, we're not gonna stand for this. We didn't stand for this in the past. Uh, we are uh, gaining momentum and winning momentum. And, and I think it's very important that the statement goes out. I'm in full support and I encourage all of us to keep the pressure on and let's keep winning. We deserve it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. You're so right. This is a, this is a class attack. This is uh, friends, friends of the government get richer on inside deals and tip offs. And the people that need the help, people that turn to the government that's there, they're not getting it. And it's a shameful thing. And where we're stuck with, with this crew for a few years and their majority, but as we pro proved last uh, fall, when we come together and speak out with one voice, they have no choice but to listen. It's uh, friends of the movement like uh, Comrade Shen that help us out and they're fighting on the inside from their elected positions, looking after school board and keeping education public. As we all know, the tr traditional right-wing agenda is underfund public services that are important, underfund the important things to us in a society, create a crisis and privatize, and we can't stand for that. Okay, well, I guess, I guess everyone likes the statement and everyone uh, agrees with what's being said because it is important and it's something we should come together with. Uh, moving along. Well, I guess we'll uh, ha have a vote on the statement. Judging by your silence, here we are. Just check the box, yes, no, abstain. Don't forget to hit submit. And then we'll uh, wait for the results from... Move along. Um, uh, we have five seconds left to vote. Five, four, three, two, one and Paul. Back to you, Mr. Vice President. We have a pass with 98%. Awesome. Well, the 98% is reflected in the number of speakers we had. I'm going to turn it over to Susan right now because uh, 
we're, we're going to have a survey for the, the delegates meeting here, a bit, of, a bit of work we're going to ask from you, and it's good work. It's important work that helps us plan out our year. Susan? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so we know that some unions have been having their delegates meetings in person for a long time, and others of us have not met in person yet at all for those. Uh, and yet we know a lot of us are looking forward to getting together in person for more things. Uh, we know that in-person delegate meetings offer us the opportunity to do things that we can't do on Zoom from, you know, those informal chats that happen before and after the meetings and sometimes during the meetings to um, draws for striking workers or giveaways, the opportunity to pick up handouts when you're at those meetings. We can really see the intensity and the power and the energy of people and groups and fights. And we get the opportunity to hear group reports of successful struggles. And I'm sure you have your own list of reasons for wanting to get together in person. On the other hand, you know, we know that Zoom allows us um, to keep safe, to be healthy, especially during COVID, you know, to avoid some of the problems of weather and traffic and unexpected interruptions. So we have a, we have a, a, a sort of online survey that we're going to do here the same way that we do for voting uh, that we'd like those of you who are online to, to participate in tonight. And we want to find out what you're thinking about a return to in-person meetings. We want to find out what you think works, what doesn't work, what kinds of restrictions or conditions would, would be needed if we, if we go to in-person meetings. So we have four questions for you that we're going to put up. The, your, your input is going to be one of a range of ways uh, that we get information to help the executive board make a decision about whether and how to return to in-person meetings. So we're not going to share the, the, um, the results back with you because they're, they're like multi-part questions and things like that. But you can be sure we're going to take into consideration what you have to say for us. So there are four questions. That means you'll have to scroll down. Um, the first one, the third one, and the fourth one are single choice questions, and the second one is multiple choice. And if there's anybody on the phone that uh, wants to participate in it, what well, if you can do, if you can send us an email, and then we can forward the questions to you. So let me just put this up for you and launch it. To give you time, I think we'll we'll take about two and a half minutes and see if um, if everybody's had a chance and uh, to take a look at it. And if you have any questions, you could put them in the chat or call them out. So, has it been launched? Does it? Okay, I don't know why it says share results. Stop sharing. Hmm. Relaunch. Continue. Yes. There we go. All right, so take your time looking over. You'll see the little scroll button down the right-hand side. So you'll see what we're asking is, should the Labor Council consider holding in-person general membership meetings? And there's a bunch of choices for you there. If in-person meetings are held, what are some of the conditions under which those should be held, including whether there should be virtual options? And then we want to find out if there is an in-person meeting in the next couple of months, would you like to attend in person? And if there is a virtual or Zoom meeting in the next couple of months, would you prefer to attend virtually? So we'll, we'll give a bit of time for that to sink in. All right, it's important because we're, we're looking for your guidance, your thoughts on uh, how we move forward uh, as we're coming out of this terrible pandemic and it's, we're not out of it yet. Being a great one for chit chat, it's still two nothing in the juniors gold medal game, and I believe it's zero zero in the Leaf versus Seattle game. Uh, 
I hope you all had a chance to uh, get a break over the last few weeks in this crazy holiday season for those that enjoy it. Uh, well, that's one of the questions. Yes, uh, I just saw it pop up in the chat uh, about hi hybrid. Yep, that, that's one of the options available. It's just your own preference. There's no names tagged to it or anything else. We, we, we want to try to follow what the uh, delegates' uh, intentions are. Oh, I don't know how the Habs doing. Just since you ask, and because I know it's probably a burning question for y'all, my favorite, my second favorite team after the Leafs is who's ever played in Montreal. But thank you for asking. All right, I'm going to leave this up for about 45 seconds longer. I can see there are still a few people, not not those of us on staff, but there's still a few people who haven't participated. So I'll give you a, a five second warning when we're going to close it down. Already, and I'm informed Seattle just scored. That's okay. A little diversity's never heard. Or, uh, uh, never mind. Uh, please read it. Everyone participate. And uh, should we move on, Susan? Yep. I'll give five seconds, and I'll close the poll. But thank you. Um, what What's clear is that. There are a lot of mixed feelings about things and um, still strong support for at least ensuring that um, the Zoom option continues to be available. We'll take this back along with other information sources and um, the executive board can digest it over the next month or two. We do know at some point we want to get together in person because we have things that we want to give away to people um, as we go through uh, an archiving process. Thanks for your input. Yeah, uh, thank you for participating. I see uh, Comrade Magnar with his hands up. Uh, I think we're, well, we'll go to a couple of, there's brother or Comrade Ross. We'll, I guess we have a couple of minutes looking at the time. We're slightly ahead of schedule. Uh, you have the floor, Brother Magnar. Please keep your comments brief. Thanks very much. Uh, I will endeavor to keep my comments brief. Um, I, th I think it's important that Labor Council conducted the survey um, that we've just participated in, um, but I think there's uh, some nuance and some color that might uh, bear some discussion amongst the delegates. Uh, in particular, and, and uh, I think some comments got back to the executive from OPSU, um, that uh, there's a question about how, what, what sort of a hybrid option are we looking at? Um, and uh, has Labor Council explored, explored the uh, technical solution that would allow for anyone, at, any delegates in particular, but anyone attending uh, virtually to fully participate in the meeting? So that that would end, in fact, um, for all delegates, no matter how they're attending, to participate fully. And by that, what I mean is that uh, debate happening in the room in person would be uh, mic'd in such a way that those uh, participating virtually could hear the full debate. And equally, those uh, attending in online, um, their comments could be uh, amplified broadcast to the meeting room so that in effect it's one meeting with everyone having uh, the full ability to participate, to hear, to speak, uh, to make comments and to vote. Uh, and then secondly, the, uh, the other question is, um, are we able to conduct hybrid votes uh, by show of hand and uh, using an online solution for those who are attending that way? I would say that I think um, I'm of two minds on this personally. I think uh, a hybrid solution is really important if we're gonna move to in-person uh, in meetings. There are people who are not comfortable or for health reasons aren't able to attend in person or take the risk of attending in person. In addition, to be frank, and I think we've all discovered this, the ability to attend online allows a lot of delegates who might not always be able to make a meeting in person to nonetheless participate. And I think that that's a really important thing. On the other hand, the reality is that uh, I think we're all feeling uh, Zoom fatigue. 
uh, witnessed the discussion we just had on an important statement about a municipal democracy and about the risks involved in Bill 23 and 39 to democracy, to public services, to good jobs of the city. We didn't even talk about the environmental impact of uh, the the those those bills, which will result in uh, you know it's tied into the raid. My, my, Miles, comrade, please. It's we got the gist of your message. It's okay. I'm just I'm just wrapping yeah. up. So yes, these, no, but we've already moved on from bill the bills. It's, right, I right. So what, so I appreciated the floor. The, Thank the you, brother. Let me just open on the let, statement. Let me just wrap up on this on this please issue. Do. Okay, you're, I will do. So uh, I think what we are discovering is that the kind of lively discussion and debate that we need to have at Labor Council meetings on issues that matter uh, to the labor movement uh, is stifled by um, the fatigue that we're all experiencing online. Thank you. Uh, Joe, did you want to say something or can we move on? You're muted currently, brother. Comrade. Yeah, good evening, Jeff. Can you hear me? Good evening. Uh, mm -hmm. What I like to say, I disagree with the previous speaker for the simple reason why. Uh, how are you going to build up a movement online? Uh, in my view, it should be done in person so people can share their ideas and in person. And we used to have at our uh, local union meeting in person and virtual. We got rid of the virtual for the simple reason why we found out people were voting twice. They were voting in person and they were voting on the phone. So therefore we got rid of it. I don't object if they can watch it, they cannot speak, they can only listen. I don't object that. But it is, the, it is, oh, by the way, I forgot to say Happy New Year to all. <laughs> Hopefully we better one than the one with, is gone. Uh, how do you, you know, suppose, uh, how you, virtually, would you be able to set up a picket line virtually, Jeff? How are you going to do it? Is that a joke? Uh, no, I think no, it is. Th thank you. Thank you for, for your comments. Uh, Joe, I, I'm going to I'm going to hear about this. No, staff yes. wrap up. I yeah, disagree no. with the previous speaker in many many things yeah. he said. Thank you. No, thank you, and that's why we did the poll, and I, I appreciate the comments. People will uh, vote twice. Believe me, we found that out. Thank okay. you. Okay, fair, fair enough. Thank you. Well, at least they care to participate. There, there is technology. We we have hybrid executive board meetings for the council. Uh, we have a thing called an owl camera that it turns to the speaker and everything else. It's a bit difficult, but that's why we're doing a poll and that's why there's no names attached and we'll move forward from there. I thank yeah, you for your comments. It's Joe, if you could mute please, uh, yeah. comrade. Yeah. And we'll, we'll move on for there. It's just, uh, I'm thank gonna, you. cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everyone for participating and thank you for the comments. Uh, this is the problem with putting me in charge. I wing it and just open the floor. Anyway, we're on the correspondence. And before I turn this over to Secretary Abdi, I just want to mention that one of the items that we're going to be voting on tonight is about sending delegates to the CLC convention in Montreal in May. We will not be voting on CLC resolutions tonight. The deadline's in February, and we have a delegates meeting, I believe, before that. So uh, resolutions from the council will come to the meeting then. Uh, instead, at our next meeting, if it will bring forward those uh, resolutions, this is just about sending uh, Labor Council staff to participate in the CLC convention. Over to you, uh, Abdi, please. Thank you, Comrade Chair. Uh, comrades, we have three correspondents tonight. The first one is request from Council of Canadians for a donation. We have donated $200 in the past. The executive board recommends a donation of $200. Can I have a motion, a mover? So moved. Seconder. I'll second. Thank, Thank you. you, comrade Salim. And the votes before you, yes, no, abstain. Don't forget to hit submit.
Homer has five seconds left to vote. Five, four, three, two, one. And Paul, back to you, FD. We have a pass with 91%. Merci beaucoup, comrade. Uh, second correspondence is convention call for Canadian Labour Congress convention to be held on May 8 to 12, 2023 in Montreal. Deadline for resolution is, is February 6, 2023. Deadline for credentials is April 6, 2023. Registration fee is 400 per delegate. The executive board recommends that we register three delegates. The president attends by virtue of the office, one delegate to be a member of staff, and the third delegate will be a youth delegate. I so move the motion. Can I have a seconder? I'll second it, Carol Carpenter. Carl, Thank you. Comrade Carl, merci beaucoup. Can we have the mechanism, comrade? And you should see the vote, yes, no, abstain, and please hit submit. Comrades, we have five seconds to vote. Five, four, three, two, one, and four. Back to you, Jack and Abdi. We have a pass of 90 percent. Merci, awesome. Thank you, comrade. The third and final correspondence for tonight is request from Chinese Canadian National Council, Toronto Chapter, for a donation towards their 2022 fundraiser to be held from December 9, 2022, to January 15, 2023. The executive board recommends a donation of 100. Dollars. I assume more of it. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Chohal. Merci beaucoup. Can we have the mechanism for my? There's the pop up. Vote on the donation to the Chinese Canadian National Council. Yes, no, maybe. Or decline, abstain, sorry. Don't forget to hit uh, submit. Comrades, you have five seconds left to vote. Five, four, three, two, one, and four. Back to you, Abdi and uh, Jeff. We have a pass with 93%. That concluded, Comrade Jeff. Back to you. All right. Thank you. Uh... Thank you for the correspondence, Secretary Abdi, and thank you, uh, uh, Cindy, for the results. So we're, we're going to have another speaker now, and this is specifically about violence and safety on the, our frontline workers. O over throughout the COVID pandemic, they were heroes, they were doing the job, yet frustration, depression, wh whatever it is, there's increasing violence, there's suffering. Uh, many of the frontline workers, and it, it all ties back to mental health issues, the lack of support coming through the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic. Uh, it's also injustices uh, that working people are facing all around us, increasing rent, the cost of food, raising cost of living, and lack of support from this provincial government. At the same time, community, community members, often the workers themselves are experiencing the violence. We're going to turn it over to a, a friend to this uh, Labour Council. He's the president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 113, uh, uh, Comrade Marvin Alfred. And, and he's going to uh, give us a, a little uh, talk on what his members, which, as I said, were celebrated as frontline heroes out there still ensuring that people need transit to get around, were doing their job, and they were out there and they were experiencing this. Over to you, comrade. Thank you, good evening. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm sure you've seen lots of coverage of violence in the TTC. I'm here today to talk a little about the experience of our members, share some insights into what we have, with, of, into what's actually going on, and to tell you of our approach to keeping workers and riders safe. It feels like every day there's another story about horrible crime on the TTC. 
I'm worried there's a perception that things are getting worse. The, the city of Toronto starts its budget process next week, and you'll see a huge hole in the TTC budget because ridership is still not recovered from the pandemic. And people will not come back if they don't feel that it's safe. So how bad is it? It's probably worse than you think. When it comes to acts of violence against riders, our members are, are often witnesses or the first on the scene or to call for help when or to take care of injured passengers. We know from public data that incidents increased throughout the pandemic. Offenses against employees nearly doubled and offenses against customers went up nearly three times. That's what's being reported, but there's more. Late last year, we surveyed our members on workplace violence and harassment. More than 70% of our members have faced workplace violence and more than half experienced workplace harassment. Most of the time, they don't even bother to report incidents. Only about half the workers reported the violence and less than a third of our workers reported harassment. Why? Because they feel afraid or they think there's no point. This is not an issue for union members. There is a culture of fear at the TTC. Managers are also being harassed and threatened and driven out of their jobs. Why is this happening? We know that an increase in incidents on the TTC is a direct result of the housing crisis combined with the lack, lack of mental health services. I'm sure this is not just a transit issue, but also a frontline worker issue. Hospital workers, city workers, education workers, long-term care workers. For example, I'm sure public libraries are experiencing similar issues as people look for a warm, safe place for shelter. The TTC, like the libraries, is end up filling the gaps of our social safety network. The mayor wants to add more police and more special constables. In fact, the mayor and Councillor Burnside, the new chair of the TTC, uh, the TTC board, a former cop, have been trying to get in touch lately and try to talk about safety. They have quietly asked me to be on their team, but I think we all know why they would want someone who looks like me to support the police. But I know that more police is not the solution. They also want to add street to home workers, but not but can't get people into homes that don't exist or unaffordable. Their internal TTC data shows only one fifth of the people that they interacted with will accept, accept the offer of a shelter bed. Of that one fifth, there's a bed available for less than half. That means 90% stay on the TTC. So what can we do about it? On a national level, Local Women 3 has brought all three levels of government together on a framework to eliminate assaults on transit. One of our key requests is to have the legal protections of, for transit operators extended to all workers, maintenance, cleaning, station staff deserve the same protections as drivers. At the TTC, we're asking for a range of policy changes, including better training so workers are able to ask for help and to protect themselves, better processes to, with less judgment and more empathy so that workers feel safe to come forward to report concerns, and enhanced prevention to stop assaults from happening at all, including more protect, effective and protective barriers and increased communication and coordination internally. At the city, we need a comprehensive strategy and security plan that provides real housing solutions and a better way to respond to people in crisis. We are the eyes and ears of the street and in the system. We know where the problems are. So above all, we want what we want is for management and our political leaders to listen to us and to work with us. All on a side, as a personal note, although our local union slogan is We Move Toronto, it would not be possible without the support of the Labour Council movement. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. United we stand. Sorry, united we stand and divided we fall. Thank you for inviting me to talk tonight. All right. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Marvin, uh, comrade. This, this is, uh, we appreciate you speaking on this critical issue because it's a big problem that, that affects us all. It's uh, mental health. It's uh, in my, in one of my roles in uh, my union is I, I deal with short-term and long-term disability. And uh, while I'm not a doctor and I don't have anything to do with the adjudication, mental health is becoming a bigger, bigger issue every day with my members. It's education, it's uh, becoming commonplace with things like the Bell Let's Talk Day and that sort of thing that it's more accepted. Uh, it's a difficult subject. I'm sure all the delegates here uh, deal with somebody in their own family if not their own issues. And it's just talking about it and bringing it out in the open is a big help. But the violence about people just going about their, their doing their jobs, it's difficult and it's something that we can't uh, stand for. And I, I thank you and your members for the job that you're doing. And thank you for sharing your experiences with us tonight. Thank you, thank you so much. If I may add just one point, uh, if you don't mind. Um, 
I believe that we're getting the spotlight is on right now because of the media, but this is something that the province, I think, has abdicated the responsibility, the resources that are needed in all services and all uh, frontline workers across the whole province that have not had their needs met. The infrastructure has been the underpinning funding has not been there and had to make do and we and all uh, frontline workers have been, you know, have to bear the brunt of the governments not filling their roles and providing the services and resources. And we all have to, we have the tools. We're, we, even though we're not given the tools in order for uh, to persevere yet, we still will withstand what we need to do and try to make the, you know, society safer. And I think we need to call out the governments that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The provincial government has a majority government. They have the will to do whatever they want and we can't allow them to get away with what they're doing. The, again, that this attack that's happening, what's happening right now in transit, what's happening everywhere in labor, we have to call them out for what's going on. We will do our part. And again, Labor Council is where you know we start and we're all going to be supportive and trying to get what's happening done. And what happened with the, the education workers, I'm proud to at least have a small part that I think that's a momentum we got to keep going. Here, here. Here, here. Well said. Thanks. Sorry for thank you for indulging me for just that little statement. No, no, of course not. You, you, you speak for a lot of people that are going through this right now. A lot of the workers, and it's important to share. And, and you're so right about this government not meeting our needs. So uh, we, we, I thank you all for participating in the uh, survey about uh, in-person meetings, uh, accommodations, and everything else. Now we're going to task you for a little bit more work, just trying to set uh, the agenda for the council. Uh, I know we, you'll have, we're going to uh, have a, a discussion uh, about organizing non-union workers uh, and, and the violence, I'm, I'm not, the, the issue of the violence on workers and everything else, that's something we're looking at. We're going to all, we're going to readdress and try to figure out where we go from here. It's addressed partially in the statement, the extra police, uh, the money for the police, that should be going to uh, mental health issues, more workers and counselors and that sort of thing. And it's up to us to come together on that. Speaking of South, something we should come together on is uh, organizing non-union workers. So density in Canada uh, is, is of union has been stagnant around 32% just slightly less than one, one third of workers in this country. Uh, much of that's in the public sector. Uh, I know I see uh, past president, comrade Cart right there, and he always talked about how for many people, it's get a job, join the union. Somebody doesn't go through school and say, oh, I wanna join a union. I wanna be a proud union member. They become that definitely, uh, but a lot of times you get a job, you join a union. But we've been stagnant. We won't even talk about the uh, United States and the tire fire they, they are for the working class. But so what we want to do is uh, have a discussion on how do we increase union density, and that's through organizing. Uh, I, I don't mean to introduce it as a class war, but my own international convention last year uh, President Biden spoke, and he talked about the pathway to middle class is through a union. You want a good job with benefits, with a pension at the end of your working career, it's unions. That's the head of a country, a, a, a financial giant in the world, and he recognizes union. Private sector union is very important because if we can raise that floor for all workers, we raise it for everyone. So if we can look after the private sector workers, it helps those in the non-union. So what, before we get to uh, the bit of work I'm going to give us, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Leslie Price. She is the United Food and Commercial Workers, the UFCW. Uh, we're all familiar with her. She's the organizing director. And just to try to give a bit of context of what we're going to be doing next, she's going to, uh, Leslie's going to tell us her own experiences and why organizing workers in this era is more important than ever. And I think this is important and, and everyone try to relate it to your own experiences and uh, hopefully when we get to the breakout session, it'll, we'll get some wonderful results to take back to the executive board. Hi, Babel. I'm sorry. Over to you for uh, your experiences, Leslie. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, good evening, everyone, and Happy New Year. I can still say that, right? <laughs> it's only January 5th, so 
Um, I was asked to come here tonight and speak about the importance of getting non-union workers into unions. And my first inclination is to speak about our success of our Indigo campaigns. Um, I'm going to try to stick to my script here tonight so I don't obliterate my uh, five minute window, but I'll do my best. Um, so the Square One Mississauga Indigo Chapters location was the first to organize. Uh, we saw these workers come together with passion and creativity and ownership um, and commitment to their colleagues and campaign like no other. Um, the campaign brought media attention to retail workers via social media. Articles were written um, by several mainstream news outlets. Community support, um, including writers, activists, teachers, and community leaders, um, including Olivia Chow, Matthew Green, Libby Davies, Jamie West, um, Jill Andrews, they spoke directly to Indigo workers about why they support their efforts to unionize. And this outpouring of support from the community, from teachers unions, um, it just it just started a wave of, of retail organizing, I think, across the country. Um, obviously, the retail industry is has proven difficult in the past to organize. Um, you know, there's so many challenges in the retail environment, um, high turnover, uh, casual work, part-time work, seasonal work, um, all those things make it really difficult to, to maintain unionization at locations. Uh, but this, this campaign, I think, was a direct result of the pandemic. Um, the way that management chose to, to sort of deal with, you know, all the concerns that were bringing forward from these workers, um, they, were, they were just literally being dismissed. And these workers really decided early on that their concerns there were not a priority for their employers. Um, the people making decisions affecting their livelihoods and their safety and their family's safeties, they, they couldn't count on that. They couldn't, they, they couldn't rely on them. So they reached out to us and, um, Sorry here, so I don't miss anything. Um, so they reached out to us and I'd like to say that the Indigo workers, um, they take a lot of pride in their, their workplace. They really respected their managers. They really respect you know, their colleagues. Um, I would say that they're sort of an extended family. You know, They share common core beliefs, core interests. Um, but like I said, their individual concerns regarding their safety, they were just being dismissed. And I think the main reason they, they reached out to us is so that they could collectively have their voices heard to affect real change in their workplaces. Um, the square one vote was held on September 22nd, 2020. And literally just a few, a few short weeks later, the, um, the chapters Indigo and Coquitlam BC also unionized. I think that was in October. Um, so immediately following those two wins, um, Indigo announced new policy for workers countrywide. Uh, wage increases were given, which was unheard of, um, between two and a half to 10 percent for workers um, that were employed for more than one year. Uh, service reps, um, just just during the actual pandemic, they they canceled the contract for the cleaners to come into their their washrooms and. Uh, they pushed those duties onto the the workers there, so they they immediately announced that they would stop use or stop making the um, the workers on the floor clean bathrooms. Um, they were given fourteen paid sick days for uh, any worker that tested positive for COVID, and um, ten paid sick days and wellness hours were also provided across the floor. So these changes were obviously done for you know the the sole reason to halt the organizing campaigns that were happening. But nonetheless, um, you know, it, it's a win for workers. Um, it, it still raises the floor for all workers, union and non. So this literally occurred before we even got to, um, you know, talking about first uh, round of negotiations or notice to bargain. So I think that was that was really beneficial, and that was that was really something for for us to see as you know members, our new members to our union family, and I think to all retail to re retail people across. Um, our country. Uh, since then, three additional chapters, Indigo locations unionized, um, Yorkdale, uh, Woodbridge, and Scarborough locations all joined um, the unionization process and won their votes. Uh, Staples reached out to us um, where we had a campaign. PetSmart reached out to us where we had a campaign. Um, and, and this is all great news, but unfortunately, the, the work doesn't stop there. As a labor movement, we have to continue these organizing um, campaigns for retail workers, especially. Um, the challenge for us now is, is 
we're not only needing to organize new workers to, to become union members, but we have to organize our unionized workplaces as well. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but because of the high turnover in, in retail locations, it's it's really required that we continue to educate these members and let them know what the benefits are to unionization. Um, you know, employers, as turnover happens, employers have the, the sole right to hire whomever they choose. And, you know, the, the complete control and opportunity to provide, um, you know, anti-union sentiment or messages to these workers. So it's, it's really important for all of us, I think, to, to make that commitment to these workers that we're still going to continue to support them and make our messaging known to, to these workers that there are beneficials or benefits to, to joining our union. Um, yeah, I, I can't express enough how important it is if we go to a, an Indigo location and, and talk to these workers, um, any retail location for that matter, and talk to these workers about the benefits of unionization, just to sort of offset the messaging that they're receiving from their employers. Um, we can't be complacent when trying to assist workers in achieving better working conditions. Um, the, the work is not done when they win their vote. The work isn't even done when they ratify their first agreement. agreement. The movement, I mean, our movement has to be committed to these workers uh, long-term. And, you know, although these workplaces that were unionized raised the floor um, across the country, we, we need to fight to maintain these gains and win new gains through renewal collective agreements. Um, as we all know, the challenges to unionization is always changing. Um, employers um, all, always use new tactics. Their legal teams always come up and, and they're just always relentlessly fighting against unionization and willing to spend, you know, thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars to ensure workers are not successful in their plight for unionization. So union, our, our union, Local 1006A's commitment and vision for workers in all industries is to encourage worker engagement and education um, our local needs to continuously adapt and pivot with every single organizing campaign and ensure that um, workers understand the benefits. Um, they're empowered, they're knowledgeable, um, and, you know, to set them up for, for success because ultimately they're going to have to deal with, you know, a lot of repercussions during a vote week, for instance. Um, so, you know, we need to prepare them for that. And um, I use the word inoculate them. So really give them an idea of what to expect. So when it actually happens, it's it's not so intense because we, we've we sort of forewarned them and, and let them know that that's going to happen. Um, you know, employer tactics are, are it's, a, it's an intense week, especially during vote week. Um, our organizing department is available to support those workers. There goes my dogs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, relationships are, are built, personal relationships are built with these workers. Um, they come to depend on us, trust us, and um, just know that our commitment is, is unwavering. Um, every organizing campaign won is not only a win for the labor movement, it's a win for all workers, it's a win for their family members, um, it's a win for our communities. And I think I'll just end tonight by just saying, um, there's a quote here by Harry Bridges, and it's labor cannot stand still, it must not retreat, it must go on or go under. The most important word in the language of the working class is solidarity. So. Very, very well said. Thank you, Comrade Prince. Uh, that, that is so true. And it's just the little things that we can do as allies, as friends of in the movement, is you let them know they're not alone. If there's, uh, I'm sure, uh, uh, if we could share campaigns, I know some of them are, are a bit more overt, uh, a bit more covert, overt, that sort of thing. But it's important to let the let the workers in an organizing campaign know exactly exactly what was shared with us uh, through her experience is they get afraid. It's it, it, even in unionized building trade industries like my my own union. My workers tend to identify with the employers more because they sign the paychecks and and the industries and the lawyers and everything else and the advisors from the states, they'll companies will spend tens, thousands of dollars finding out how to defeat the unions rather than just helping their workers. It's just it's a growth industry and it's terrible. And that's the whole thing is the isolation, the loneliness in an organizing campaign. And it takes a toll on the organizers too. Thank you very much for sharing your experience because I know UFCW is a very busy organization trying to organize and it's not all 
people that are at the higher at the higher end of the wage scale, a lot of them part-time workers, a lot of them are people that are just earning minimum wage or a little bit over, just like the steel workers with a lot of their their members. And it's hard. And I appreciate you what you're doing for the union. And I really want to thank you for coming, sharing your experiences with us, because this sets us up for our next our next part. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a breakout session. I, I know if you wanted to come to a labor council, learn a little bit, but this is work. This is new in the year. The executive board is looking for help and that, that comes from you. We want to talk about getting more non-union workers unionized or more workers who are not in a union into a union. So what we want to do is we want to try to recreate that feeling of the roundtable discussions like we had at the OFL building or at the in-person delegate meetings at Lawrence with the roundtables and everything else. We want to get your thoughts. We want to get your experiences and we'll bring them together. Uh, and that's what it's important is the shared experience. What works, what doesn't work. Uh, it, it's to be more to bring you all into this so it's not just a one-sided listening to the guy in the blue sweater babble. We want to take this discussion about the importance of getting workers not in a union into a union. Get the nuts and bolts of how in short discussions. Uh, this will be ongoing. We're going to do this a, a couple of meetings. In a minute, I'm going to turn it over to Skylar. Uh, she'll explain it much better than I can. And, and let me tell you, there's no ideas when it comes to organizing campaigns that are wrong. It, it's If you've done something, it, whether you're an organizer or not, we all hear stories from within our own organizations, our own experiences. And together, we can change the world. And this is one step at a time. Let's increase union density and we'll have a better society. Uh, Skylar, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so this is uh, just very brief. Um, we're gonna be spending uh, 12 to 15 minutes, probably around 15 minutes in our breakout room. So please don't leave. You can stick around for that. It would be great. We really wanna hear your voice. Um, the breakout sessions are going to be led by an executive board member in most cases. Um, and there's going to be about a dozen people in each room. So uh, there's enough time for everybody to speak up. Uh, you're going you're, you've already been assigned. You don't need to choose your room. You're just going to be, uh, we're going to like hit a button and you'll be sent off to that room. And I think, Jennifer, you correct me if I'm wrong. Um, people should be able to return to the main room if they uh, are not sure what's going on or are just uncomfortable. Yeah. So uh, that's still an option. Um, and uh I think all of the breakout session leaders have what they need. And if they don't, maybe they could pop back into the main session and we'll get them sorted out or, or yeah. text me. <laughs> okay, I think we're good, Jennifer. I'm gonna open the rooms, please uh, accept. So it says, I think you have to enter room, say join, you have to click join. Um, there's a few people who are not joining. Barbara, uh, Dora, Helen, Joe, Ling, Lisa, Jace, Andrew, Chris, Jim, Dave C, Andrew, Les, just click join. There's still quite a few people who haven't joined. 